Hello and welcome to No Chords But The Truth podcast in association with the British Country Music Festival. How much we're going to miss the British Country Music Festival this year. Last year was so much fun, but 2021 will be back stronger, won't we? This is Matt Spracklin. I'm in my garage in my little studio I've made to accommodate me doing my country hits radio show and also podcasts like this. And on this episode of the No Chords But The Truth podcast, I chat to Megan O'Neill who played the British Country Music Festival last year. In fact, we talk a little bit about that. It was so good to catch up with Megan. You're going to love this chat. Hear all about how she's dealing with the lockdown, her time living in Nashville, touring with Tom Jones, so much more. What an incredible artist Megan is. It's always a joy to talk music with her. Enjoy. Well, it's a big place, actually. Oh, so jealous. (laughs) Go get something. Uh (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm okay. Otherwise, I won't. I have a riding session at four o'clock, and that could end really badly if I or... start. <laughs> <laughs> or go really well, yeah. <laughs> well, Megan O'Neill, uh, thanks for joining me on the No Calls But the Truth podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Matt. That's all right. Um, I want to jump straight in because I, I feel like every interview, every chat, every conversation, even just picking up the phone to a mate, always starts with uh, where in the world are you and how are you surviving lockdown? <laughs> So is that where we're going? That's where we're going, straight (laughs) in with that lockdown chat. Um, I am in Ireland and I'm very, I'm very lucky really. I live like in the middle of nowhere and, and sometimes that can be a pain in the ass, but actually during lockdown, that's lovely because we've got fields and rivers and lots of space. Um, and lockdown has been, I think in the first few weeks I was like, this is great. I'm going to get so much done. (laughs) Yeah. And now I'm like, oh, God, I'm really sick of it now. I miss playing shows. <laughs> I've spoken to a few artists that are like, yeah, I'm just going to, I've got time to write and I've got all this. But like, do, do, have you lost inspiration for writing? Ma- or Massively. Have you? Just because there's Massively. less going on. Well, it's like, I have an album finished. So I don't have the, like, my album is ready to go and right. is going to come out in September time. So I'm kind of thinking like, by the time I actually get around to recording another album, it's a year away. And there's a frustration in that. There's a frustration in even thinking about like, I'm not going to play a show till next April. And, you know, keeping your motivation up when that's where your mind's going is impossible. Especially, I would imagine for like artists like you who, who, who write, uh, writing is so important to your craft and t- to your work and your music and everything. You don't stop. So it's that whole thing, like even in normal time when you write an album and then even before it's finished, you know you've got enough, like, yeah, but these are better songs. I want the-. It must be even harder, like, when it's locked down. Because you can't yeah. think of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think... I'm like- not trying to rub it in. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just going to leave now. Um, no, there's definitely, like, I have been writing. And at the beginning, I was doing loads. Like, I was doing, you know a couple of sessions on my own a week and I was doing Skype rights every week and I was like, this is great. Thinking like this would only go on for a month. Yeah. So I was like, this is amazing. I'm going to get loads done. I'm going to write the next record. But then as the weeks go on, like I'm still doing, you know, probably writing one or two songs every week. Yeah. But that wouldn't be much in comparison to what I would be used to. So, yeah, it's just... I don't know. I think I'm I'm trying to busy myself in other ways, you know, and like create video content and do like behind the song videos and live acoustic videos for all the new album tracks and stuff like that. I was, was going to say, are there benefits from it? Like you turn in any negatives and deposits in that way? Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to say to myself, like, look, Megan, you've written songs every other day for the last decade. Like, enjoy an element of this break yeah. where actually yeah. you can't do anything you can't be out like this year for me was going to be my busiest year ever as a touring musician um like i had shows solidly from mid-feb until mid-november and so that's a kicker yeah (laughs) yeah but you know like i'm trying to say look this might be the only break that you actually get because you know we know that the music industry is an absolute dogfight so when everything's when all the wheels are turning, you can't take a break. Mm. So there's an element of me being like, you know what? If I want to take a day off, I'm going to take a day off because. Have you done, how many live streams have you done? 
I did one a week for the first four or five weeks. Right. And then I did three in one week and I was like, fuck this. So <laughs> Yeah, this is what this is what I mean. You can oversaturate yourself, but also you need to stay relevant. I, I find like one of the things that the co- the common sort of uh sort of threads through a lot of the conversations i've had is staying relevant so like when you come out the back it's almost like this whole thing whether you're a musician or whether you're a writer with being a musician what even in like from my side of things being a presenter and doing what i do you have to stay relevant because it's going to be like an open playing field when it's all over do you know what i mean it's like everyone's going to be like jumping into the into the fray so you do yeah. have to find that balance you do and unfortunately the music industry, like being an artist or being a presenter, actually being anyone creative, it all feeds off momentum. Yeah. So when you have that momentum, and I really felt like I had it before this all crashed. Like I had so many shows. I had two records coming out this year. One I was featured on all the tracks and one I was, which is mine. And like, was touring and we had tours in New Zealand and Australia and everywhere that weren't even announced yet. So like when you feel like you've, and and, you know, you've booked those shows eight to 12 months in advance. So you're like, I was definitely at the beginning of this year being like, yes, like so much momentum. I signed with a new agency. I signed with a new lawyer. I was meeting like loads of managers and I was like, this is, this is it. Like this is the year. And when that's, taken away from you and you have absolutely no no power like it's not your fault it's just gone that's difficult a but yeah b you have to be like okay i need to find a way to still make this work for me Mm. and still whether that's releasing new songs which i've done which has actually worked quite well for me or creating video content or just doing something actually totally different like I don't even know like I've started doing behind the song videos which I probably wouldn't have done because I would have been on tour and not had the time so it's trying to find other ways but you know you get pissed off as well (laughs) because you're like yeah it's hard there's so much like every time I go onto Instagram and there's 20 live streams happening yeah exactly it actually it actually makes me come off Instagram. Yeah. It just, they're just, it's just in your face all the time. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, social media, uh, uh, there's obviously a, a point for everyone right at the beginning of all this when, because obviously the, the shows have trickled out as well. It's not just been like right, everything's off until the certain date. You know, festivals been dropping bit by bit. So obviously so many artists are going around live streaming, live streaming, and then like they fill up. And you, you have to, you, I, I don't know, I, I think you've got to be clever in that way and distance yourself. And you, people panic about not creating enough content. People panic about creating too much content. I don't think there's really a, I don't really think, I think everyone's feeling this out. The thing is, no, it's never happened before. No one's ever had to stay in their house forever before. So it's like, yeah. it, is, it is on you and it is, it's fascinating because it seems that everyone I've talked to has just got a different way of looking at it, which is brilliant, really. Yeah. I think, you know, and, and there's definitely an element as well of like, like some of my friends who, like a producer that I work, that I've worked with plenty and he's literally the best musician I have ever met across all, like he can play every instrument. He's an insane producer and engineer and he's done nothing <laughs> since this stopped. And he was like, I just can't. Yeah. Like I just cannot find that motivation and that inspiration so everyone's everyone's feeling it out really differently um and like yeah i think the longer it goes on the harder it gets to motivate yourself yeah um like i'm playing guitar every day and guitar is a new a new ish instrument to me anyway i only really started playing it live like a year and a half ago so i'm like great this is you know i can spend an hour a day like improving this instrument and then i'm like i'm not gonna fucking play this instrument live for a year what am i doing so <laughs> think how good you'll be then though <laughs> i'll be unbelievable but like there's there's definitely that you know i think i think there is a need to feel relevant but there's also a need to like give yourself a break yeah like we are all being we're all doing our best and there's there's this pressure which is always in this industry there's always this pressure but 
you know, there's this pressure to be like always creating more and writing more and being better and coming out of this with new skills. But like people are losing people they love. Mm. People are getting sick. Like it's not just a time to improve yourself. Whatever you need to do to get through this, do that. And if you can do some live shows in the middle, great. <laughs> <laughs> do a Keith Urban drive-in show. Did you see that? That's crazy. Yeah, I'm actually doing a drive-in show. Um, oh, really? Here, yeah, yeah, with uh, Hudson Taylor and Jamie Lawson. Amazing. Um, they just announced it there the other day in the paper. But um, yeah, so things like that that are coming out of it are super cool. That is cool. You know, New cool. new way of looking at it. Well, I mean, I feel we've known each other for a year or two. Like, I know, I know a fair bit about you. I want to, I want to get into it all. But like, where did it start? Like, have you always? I don't know this about you. Like, did you grow up? I was talking to I was talking to Jake Morrell, um, on on one of these podcasts, and he said, "Oh yeah, I started learning guitar about you know sixteen, seventeen. I was like, "What really?" Do you know what I mean like that felt late? But like, what was it for you? Were you always you come from a musical family? What's the whole What's the whole background there? Yeah, so I um, I grew up in a, a typical like Irish family where everybody sings and everybody plays an instrument. Oh, and amazing. You'd go down to the pub when you were 10 years old with like a bag of tato and playing pool in the back room and everyone would be playing instruments, like pulling fiddles out of their bags. And it was just a, that's just how it is here. So I really gravitated towards music as a kid and when I was in primary school, I just, I just wanted to, like, I remember when I was like five and that would have been junior infants here. Um, I, I like, I distinctly remember standing up on the tables in my classroom singing and I've absolutely <laughs> no idea what prompted that. <laughs> Maybe nothing, <laughs> but I always gravitated towards singing and performing. I was always in plays and shows and I was big, big into musical theater as a teenager. I did a bunch of shows every year. Um, and Instrument wise, I started playing piano at six um, and I did all of my classical grades, actually, because my mom wanted all of us to have an instrument. Um, but as you're, you know, 12, 13, 14, obviously you don't want to. You like, yeah. You're like, why do I have to do these exams? They're stupid. <laughs> but now I'm very grateful that I did all of that. And um, yeah, I just... I, I I genuinely thought my route was going to be musical theatre, but I can't dance. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a stop, that's a blocker. <laughs> it's a little bit of a blocker. I didn't have how all did, three. How, how did you know you can't dance? Did you just realise it or did someone say, <laughs> That that's rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> well, on a lot of the shows that I did, I I got the lead role. But that yeah. was due to my voice. Like that was <laughs> completely due to my singing. And they were just like minimize the amount of dances I had to be in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like right this is a sign but when I um when it came to going to college and I was 18 and I thought I I wanted to do a course in drama and acting um but the course that I actually wanted which is in Trinity College um shut down the year I wanted to start it uh. which is such a shame because it was like a lot of amazing actors went went through that program um, and come out of Ireland but anyway so I went and I studied psychology um, at UCD University College Dublin and I was there three weeks and I got a scholarship for singing that I didn't even cool. know existed before I went to the college um, again it was my mom who was like Megan did you know they have a singing scholarship at <laughs> UCD and I was like no I didn't and she was like, well, the auditions are this week, so you better get your ass down there. <laughs> so um, I went down and I auditioned and I got it the three consecutive years I was at uni. Um, and that was kind of the, I had been writing songs since I was about 14 and I'd been in like punk bands and rock bands and really? pop bands. Oh, like everything you can, everything. I tried everything when I was See, a See, I didn't notice about you. Yeah, <laughs> I did some rock bands, um, but I never really looked rock. Like the blonde hair and the blue eyes didn't really make me stand out in the rock world, really. I should have dyed my hair black. Mm -hmm. But um, I did all of that. And then when I went to uni, the scholarship singing took over because we 
did competitions and traveled around the world um, singing as this small choral group. And that was like insane training. Like it was like an intensive course in singing for three years. Amazing. My psychology degree completely fell by the wayside. <laughs> <laughs> the singing got way more attention, but I did finish it. Um, and then when I graduated, I was like, right, I've gotten my real degree um, as my parents wanted me to get. Because in Ireland, it's free. Like third level education is basically free. Right. Um, so they were like, look, just go, go to college, get that education, and then you can do whatever you want. So I came home, um, I was 21, I'd finished uni, and I was like, right, I'm moving to Nashville. My parents were like, what is <laughs> going on? Um, and then that's kind of where it all started for me. So I, I, le I left um, the, uh, the day, day after my graduation, um, in September of 2012, I believe. And um, I moved out to Nashville and then I how moved from there to London. So it all just kind of rolled from there, really. So how long were you in Nashville for? I was there for the guts of two years. Right. Yeah. Just just what? Writing, playing in bars? Yeah. Doing the I whole thing? I didn't even do that much playing. I just wrote like an, a maniac. I just wanted to really understand the craft of songwriting and I felt like Nashville like I loved country music but I hadn't really decided that was where I was going to go at all um I grew up listening to a lot of country and a lot of American country because my mom was big into that but I knew I always kind of leant more towards the like folky Americana country so it wasn't yeah. like the straight down the middle but I just loved that style of songwriting and I loved so many of the songwriters there. So I was like, great, I'll just go and, you know, try and get into as many rooms as I can. And I was really fortunate with the people that I met. I got like completely taken under the wing of um, some publishing companies there and they just put me in, you know, two rooms a day, every day, every day of the week. And I just wrote loads. <laughs> and... I came home a couple of times, like in the meantime, for visas and renewal of visas and that kind of thing. Um, but it was an amazing experience. It was very humbling because I came from actually getting like everything I went for in Ireland, I almost got, you know? Yeah. Because Ireland's small and I'm from a small part of Ireland. So when it came to shows or that scholarship or like being in bands or it was easy for me. Yeah. And then I went to Nashville and I was like, oh shit. Yeah. This is the real deal. <laughs> but I mean, I know a lot of people say, well, I go to Nashville. Have you been to Dub? Like that whole feeling of like walking down the streets and people are playing bars. I mean, you know, anyone that hasn't walked around Temple Bar on a, on a Thursday, Friday night, do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's, it's one, it's, it's up there for me. I love it. I love stuff like, you know, like the Irish descendants and obviously like the Dubliners and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But um, did you find that, or do you still find that? background and the sort of rock that obviously you must have been into to be in those bands coming in and out of your songwriting still was that a thing you had to differentiate yourself with in Nashville when you started writing more in the country way yeah I think Nashville really molded my songwriting for quite a few years um Nashville really is the majority of what's been written there back then definitely was country mm. and I kind of just threw myself into it and I was like, I'll just learn what I can learn from this, you know, but it, it molded my first two records. The first two EPs I put out were, were like, first one was very country pop. Second one was quite country blues um, with the band Megan of the Common Threads. So yeah, it, that, that molded that for me. And then the more time that I was in London and I was you know, seeing loads of different live music, listening to loads of different live music, writing with loads of writers that weren't country writers. Yeah. Um, then I was like, oh, this is, this is more of me, you know? And then I started to bring that back in with the Ghost of You record and, and way more so with this new record. I don't know if this new record is, can be termed country, but like, I mean, if Casey Musgraves can be old country, then this oh, can be old yeah. country. Yeah. <laughs> old country but, can be anything you want. And if it's yeah, not that, exactly. just, call, just call it Americana, you'll be fine. <laughs> exactly, it's grand. <laughs> um, 
but yeah this one's got a lot more like rock influence and even some pop influence and um yeah like with the ireland song that's a very folky song and i was gonna yeah. ask you about that because that is a little bit sort of a sidestep isn't it back to that that real roots you feel i love mm. it yeah um it's funny because that was the first song i'd written completely on my own in years oh really um that was the other thing with nashville nashville makes you or with me i shouldn't speak for everyone um it made me become really dependent on co-writing because that's just how it works there and i kind of had after so many years of co-writing i was like i can't write by myself like even if i go into a co-writing session and i'd write 99 percent of the song i still felt like you know the songs i wrote by myself weren't good enough but when I wrote Ireland, I just loved it. And I was like, this, you know, it feels really me. Um, and it feels like a, you know, a love song to a place that means so much to me. So I played it live for like a year. And every time I played it live, it was the one song that people were like, that's the one, you know, um, you have to record that, you have to release it. And so I did. And it's done really well. I, I put it out like three, three, four weeks ago now. Um, and it's done really well. But I think, I think a lot of the time with like, when you're an artist, if you're really honest and you write what is really from your heart, that totally seeps through. Like yeah. people hear that and they love that and they resonate with that. So that song is definitely that for me. I guess that's why artists and sort of people that they write with a lot continue to go back there because that other person hears so much of what's inside of you to get out yeah absolutely and I think having you know one or two or three people that you work really well with and mm. um, the Dunwells are definitely that for me I mean we've had so many deep meaningful chats at this point we know everything about each other <laughs> they're great um, oh they're great yeah so yeah I think having that relationship with a writer is really important going back to what we said earlier on about so much of 2020 has been taken away looking back on 2019 i i i know some of the stuff you did last year it was crazy like what what were some of the highlights yeah um last year felt like a real turning point for me kind of from when i released ghost of you that was like summer of 2018 and from there until now really has been super busy um but yeah, last year, like I did a bunch of shows. I toured in Germany and I toured in Ireland and I toured in the UK and um, I didn't really release very much music other than Girl Crush, which um, did really well on the Spotify world. <laughs> but I toured with Sir Tom Jones. I know. Uh, <laughs> That's crazy watching in those Instagram summertime. stories <laughs> pop up every day. What are you doing? I know, it was crazy. Um Oh, it was absolutely amazing. It's like last July would have been. Um, and we were actually pitching to tour with him again this summer because he was supposed to be over in Ireland doing like two or three uh. really big shows, but not anymore. Um, but yeah, we did like 15,000 people a night, which was bonkers. And I think the first show was in Bristol. Yeah, the first show was Bristol, which was 15,000 in like a cricket stadium or something. Really? Um, but it was, I, I was so anxious all day. Like I wouldn't really get nervous right before walking on stage, but I was like really stressed. Like couldn't eat anything. <laughs> um, but then once you, get, once you get on stage and you sing that first song, you're like, ah, okay, I've done this a hundred times. This is fine. Um, but it was really surreal and just mad mad do you get to meet him much on the on that tour i did yeah um we had like the third show we were in uh colchester and we had a really lovely chat and he like took one of my albums and he said he'd heard like um he said he'd heard a few of the set like a few songs on the set and he really liked them and he was an absolute gentleman like really lovely man but you know when you like stare at someone like that in person and yeah. they're a complete legend you're like i don't actually know <laughs> like this is weird <laughs> i i was um and I, I, I could come back to what i said earlier on i know you know know a fair bit about you and that but i still went to your website today 
and just thought, I'm just going to pop up on a few things. What's this about private Grammy party? Was it a Grammy party or something in LA? Oh, yeah. What's that about? Um, <laughs> this is a few years ago, and um, there is an organization called the US Irish Alliance, which brings together um, people who work in, it's, it's across a lot of, you know, sectors, but a lot of creatives who are Irish that, or work in the US, um, are American but work in Ireland, or are have Irish an- ancestry, um, but are living and working in America. And they throw this big Oscars party every year. Oscars? In Oscars party, That's what yeah. That's what in, um, in LA. And I played at it. <laughs> so it was in- incredibly like pinch me moment because it was it's jj abrams um bad robot studios which is in santa monica um and you know the party's on like these rooftops and you just it's just crazy (laughs) and there's like cocktail it's insane but that particular year they were honoring um stephen fry and uh is it jeremy corbyn no corbyn Corbyn, what the the Labour politician? No, Jeremy, I got that wrong. Jeremy It'll come Beadle? to me. <laughs> no, he presents uh, one of the like late night shows in the US. James Ooh, Corden. Big, big. No, that's isn't he not UK? Yeah, he's UK. Yeah, Jimmy yeah. Fallon. Jimmy Fallon. Oh no, we're Jimmy getting Fallon closer though. Beard, didn't he? <laughs> Don't think it's Jimmy. Oh, Fallon. oh, I know, I know. You mean? Uh, no, I know exactly what you mean. I can see his face. <laughs> I can see his face. <laughs> I I'm can go- see his face as well. I'm going to Google it. <laughs> um, and Carrie Fisher. Oh, yeah. So this was the year, it was 2015. So it was the year that the brand new Star Wars were starting to come out. And obviously that's all J.J. Abrams. So no the security of this party was absolutely insane because um, there were loads of Star Wars fans trying to break into the studio to get, you know, like sneak peeks as to what was happening with the new movies and everything. Um, But yeah, it was crazy. We were on, like all the Star Wars cast were there, um, old and new. And at the time, I hate to say it because I actually hate myself for it now. (laughs) I had never seen any of the Star Wars. Any. So I didn't know who anybody was. (laughs) And, um, but now, years later, I've watched every Star Wars and I'm like kicking myself that I didn't get to have a photo with everyone and say hi. Oh man. <laughs> have you watched them all now? I've watched them all now. They're so good. <laughs> I don't I don't think I've watched any since you know obviously there's the first three and then that time when they brought the first one out which is obviously the first. I, I saw that but I didn't think I've seen anything since. Oh you're missing out Matt. Yeah thing is though if you watch them now have you got to watch all the other ones first again to get it? No. Really? No. Uh, okay well maybe I'll watch on some point. <laughs> well, you've all the time in the world now you should probably do it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I have not got all the time in the world that's the thing I, f- I found myself busier than ever it's crazy <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel was it Jimmy Kimmel no oh in that case I've got absolutely no idea <laughs> David, David Letterman no oh, did he I'll take just... over he took over David Letterman though oh uh, I think you're gonna, you're gonna google it <laughs> who took it. over David Letterman <laughs> Stephen Colbert oh. that's him <laughs> he was there I didn't know he had a beard he he grew a big big beard the year of that party for oh, whatever right. reason. <laughs> how 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 did you find the uh, British Country Music Festival? Oh, I thought it was amazing. It's cool to play the first one. Yeah, really cool. I actually spoke to, um, about this in an interview the other day as well, and I just thought like I'm so sad that it's not back this year with Corona. But you know, I think they did an amazing job for the first year of the festival, and just brilliant acts i love seeing a festival that's actually championing championing um like local artists because you have all these other country festivals and they're just all american headliners and you're like guys come on you know (laughs) support support the actual acts that you have here um and i felt like british country music festival really did that and the setting was amazing god that Um, big room oh just stunning (laughs) Really it's so cool. good. It's great for me because like sometimes I feel like, you know, what I do with country hits and stuff as well. I feel like I should know everyone, you know, know who they are. 
But when you go to a festival and you and you find some names, you're like, oh, I didn't know these even existed. Amazing. I loved it. I, I'm mm. going to miss it this year as well. I really will miss it. Ghost of You. I feel that's a defining song. Like, do you feel that's... I mean, only for me, because it's the first song I ever heard of yours. And I think I told this on Country Hits. You, put, you may have even heard me say it. But that was one more like a long journey on a train. And it was one of those things, to come back to Spotify, where it just recommended you after I'd listened to something else. I was like, oh, yeah, Megan O'Neill. Keep me to listen to Megan O'Neill. And it popped up with Ghost of You. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I, I do feel there's something about that song as a listener of your music. But it, has, has it been one of those sort of defining songs for you as an artist or is it just been one that's you know on the on the, on the record and that's that no i think it's been a really defining one mm. it's definitely the one that like sometimes when you play it at a gig people are like oh yes and they all like recognize the intro and they all love it and it's not it's funny because it i don't think it was the one i would have thought right that happens a lot though i feel like i have bad judgment on which of my songs <laughs> are actually gonna do really well <laughs> um but yeah, I, I mean, I love that song. And for me, it's funny because that's, it definitely sounds like a breakup song. But for me, that song was, was very much so about needing to shed layers myself. Mm. Um, and almost needing to like deal with ghosts of my past, like ghosts of myself. Um, but yeah, it's it like I love it, and I, I I love that whole record. That whole record for me was the first record I'd made without compromising at all. Mm. Like I had no management at the time, I had no band that were gonna be you know that you know we all had to obviously share ideas, and I worked with a really close friend as a producer, so I wasn't afraid to like say what I wanted or. Or also to be, I think sometimes when you work with people who are so far ahead of you, or you certainly feel like they are, um, like when you work with a producer who's done so much, you're almost like, oh, probably shouldn't say anything because he probably knows better than me. So, but with this, I didn't feel that. And so the songs became way more of me and what I actually wanted rather than any compromise. That's a whole other conversation as well, isn't it? Because as as an artist, that, that, that you, you want... Not that it's control, but it is. But also, you, you, there's no one else... I, I know that you know the first thing a producer will say is, oh, I can hear it all going off in my head. No one's heard it the way you've heard it in your head. So when you have got that level of control, it's a, it's a lovely thing uh, because you can just water it, can't you? And, and let it grow and grow and grow. But on the flip side... What what what's it like when you are working with the producer that's got all this experience stuff, and you know that there'll be moments when he'll do something you'll go, I never even thought of that. That's brilliant. Mm. I think it depends. So like, when I made the stories to tell EP, um, with the band, we worked with Guy Fletcher, who's like, you know, was in the Dire Straits, produces mm. lots of stuff for, um, Mark Knopfler, and like is, <laughs> insane, like incredible. But Guy has a really calm way of working. Like he'll never push any ideas. He's just like, what if we just tried this? Or what if we just, you know, maybe tried this bass line or whatever? Like, and you're just like, oh, I love you. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I've, I've never really worked with a producer who's like bullied me into certain things, which I know there's plenty of them out there. That wouldn't kind of be what I would go for. Um, so in what in what way? Like, oh, I suppose. Well, if you haven't worked with any, then you go. but I guess yeah. I guess what you're saying is, you know, it could be anything from shortening a song because it's too long to changing lyrics and all and music and all yeah. sorts. But that's but good. Find, that, that's good. You not had that. Yeah, I mean, when I made my fir very first EP, coming home, I worked with um, I worked with Philip McGee, who's an amazing Irish producer, and he's worked with. Codaline and Snow Patrol and Delta Goodrum and so many people. The list is very long. And uh, he made some suggestions on my very first EP that actually changed songs completely, but were definitely what needed to happen. So there's that as well. You know, like I think if you entrust your music in a producer, you have to try what they're like, you're paying them for that expertise. Yeah, yeah. 
so you have to be open to suggestions they're going to make and things they're going to want to try as well as they have to be open to things you want to try yeah um, yeah like it has to be collaborative yeah is that what it was like on the record that you got ready to come out yeah um <laughs> how much do we know about that yet uh, well i've released four songs from it already so i've yeah. released ireland devilly no winter sun and rootless um and the plan was kind of to put out six singles and then put out the full album so i'll probably do two more singles and um, maybe one in june maybe one in august and then full album in september cool. um but it's my favorite thing i've ever created and you know rootless did so well as well didn't it well and devil you know yeah yeah they've all done quite well um which is amazing obviously and you know i'm i loved so much i knew i wanted to work with the dunwells on this record i just i had so many life changes and and difficult personal life changes throughout the 18 months of making this record and i initially when um initially when we spoke about making this record it was like last uh, so it would have been the summer of 2018 um right after goes of you came out and we would have talked about right will we you know will we go for it and i was still living in london at that time so we started recording like the first week of october and i moved back to ireland that week um which was completely unforeseen and was not in my plans at all but i have a sick family member and i was like i I called the dunwells and i was like guys i can't make this record like how am i gonna do this i'm living in ireland now like and you know we were supposed to do it in the space of two or three months and i was going to be up the up in leeds quite a lot and joe and dave are just the most amazing like they're two of my favorite people on the entire planet and they were like meg grand if it takes us a year to make the record it takes us a year just fly in when you can fly in we'll make the time it'll be fine so throughout from like october of 2018 until january of this year we were making that record um well actually really until march of this year because that's when we finished all the mixing and mastering um and i just flew to leeds for a week out of every month um which was mad but actually amazing and um it was so therapeutic and so explore explorative exploratory um we started I, i went in there with about 40 songs i think and I went in being like, I don't know if I've written a full album, but you know, here's loads of songs. And they were like, focus sake, Megan. That's like Forty. three albums. <laughs> <laughs> so we picked our favorite 14, that then became 13, um, which is the album is 12 tracks and one bonus really. Um, and they were amazing to work with because they let me totally take my time. And also making a record that way meant we do a load of work in a week on say three songs. And then I go away and I'd listen to those for for four weeks. Hmm. And then I'd go back and be like, I actually don't like that anymore. Or I want to change that lyric or I have a different idea for that. And there was never any time pressure. There was never any pressure of like, oh, we can't, we can't redo that. It was like, whatever we needed to do, it was like, great, let's scrap the whole thing and start again. (laughs) <laughs> let's just forget about that four days work you know so it was an amazing ma- way to make a record and there were so many wonderful people involved we had lucy Revis come in and do cello live cello on a couple of tracks and um, todd doyle here did in ireland he did drums dave and joe obviously were you know above and beyond and played all loads of it. different things yeah and their vo- their vocals all over everything as well it's just amazing um and we had lewis warren come in and play electric guitar and just everything from like the creation of it to then the mixing and the mastering of it, which was done in Ireland and the US like it's just so many good people involved um, I can't wait to hear it in full yeah I'm very excited <laughs> <laughs> have you got a release date for it? not yet um, not even in the your plan, head I'm not, yeah. asking, I'm not asking for a, for a secret <laughs> for a sneaky <laughs> preview <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the plan originally was September, October, but then because of everything that happened with Corona, you know, I spoke to my team about it and we were like, ooh, do we put it out? You know, if the whole process has been that chilled making the record, then you've got time, haven't you? You don't, you don't need to feel that pressure, I guess. Yeah, but I also feel like, unfortunately, with an album, like, it does get old in your own head. And this, is the, this is the thing, yeah. This is what, yeah. We, what we kicked off with. There's definitely an element of, like, needing to put it out. For me, yeah. like, I need that to just be out in the world now because, to me, it's done. And I don't want to push it off another six months and then put it out, but in my head, actually already be wanting to put out newer material. So yeah. I've just decided I'm putting it out either <laughs> September or October. We're just going to do it. It's going to be great. <laughs> we'll know a lot more by then. Yeah, exactly. We'll know a lot more by then. What are you listening to at the moment? What's what's inspiring you? Or what's, what, what, like if you just had to sit down like, and put a record on now, you got you get, you get a glass of wine or whiskey or whatever, put a record on, what's mm. your go-to? Um, I've actually been listening, this will probably surprise you, I've actually been listening a load in the last year to the 1975. Oh yeah, cool. I love them so much and they're so <laughs> vastly different from anything I do, um, but I love them. But yeah, like I listen to a lot of Brandy Carlisle, um, yeah. Rustin Kelly. Oh yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, I really want to get Dying Star on vinyl just because I feel like I feel like I've exhausted it so much and yet I still haven't found its full potential do you know what I mean I need it I need it on in the dark on vinyl so I need to get that at some point but yeah I feel that I, I actually had to take a break from it because I, <laughs> I listened so much when it first came out and I was like I I don't want to get sick of these songs I need to yeah. stop he, yeah um, but he's one of those for me that I can't so like you, I don't know about you but I have this sort of like bank of artists that if I just don't know what to put I need to put music on but I don't know what it is Ron Sexsmith, Russ and Kelly, like two artists I can go to straight away, put them on. Green Day, randomly, like old stuff. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, no effects, but... I feel that way about Ryan Adams, and I'm so sad that all of that shit came out with him because... I and I don't even want... It makes me as sad to just get into it, but, like, his music is that for me and has been that for me for, like, a decade. Like, any time I want to listen to anything, I'm like, yeah, that's the one. Um... But yeah, I hate when like then something like that is tainted for you because yeah. you almost feel guilty for like even thinking about listening to it, you know? I know. His, his music though, it's a really strange one for me because like for, for everything I love, so many of my friends for years have been saying, oh, li and every time it's like a different Ryan Adams album and I've tried everything and I just can't, I just have, it hasn't clicked with me yet, but oh. I mean, the Taylor Swift thing was quite cool, but his own, you know, it's, it, it's what but do you know what I do you know who I liken him to? And it's not necessarily sound wise, but I liken him to Brian Fallon. Do you know who Brian Fallon is? No. He sings in a band called the Gaslight Anthem. Oh, I've heard of them. And he's very sort of Springsteen, which is I think where I make that sort of leveller. But yeah. Yeah, it's good to have his artists you can just put on any time. But that Russ and Kelly album, man, I can't wait for album oh. three. It's gonna be amazing. Mm. He's calling it album two, I guess, isn't he? But technically it's the third, I suppose. Yeah. There's yeah. um, Phoebe Bridgers as well. Oh. If I'm completely obsessed. She's amazing. As of late, yeah. My, um, at the moment, I have two bands, which is really quite weird because I can't fly. So, like, I've a band in London and I've a band in Ireland because when I tour here, it's just, you know, easier than flying people everywhere. Um, but my guitarist in my band in Ireland is a massive Phoebe Bridgers fan. He and that. he introduced me and I was like, I can't stop now. <laughs> She's so good. The, the debut album, has she done anything since that album? Is it just the one album she's still got? Or has she brought something new out recently? She's, she's done, done something. What's the other, with the other thing with Connor Oberst? The, um, it's got a really long, quite pretentious name. I um, Sounds yeah, about but right she's done. She's done quite a lot with him as well, which I wouldn't like as much as her, as much as her solo stuff, but it's still quite good. Well, I was going to wrap this up on one final question, but actually, I'm not going to because that was such a fun chat. And the last question was going to be, "What's your biggest struggle?" And I'm like, I don't want to end it on like a downer, <laughs> like as in like with the lockdown and everything going on. I don't, I don't even want to talk about struggles. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe that out. And this is just, it's just been great to catch up with you. And it's been you, really great to catch up with you too, Matt. You really look like great. you're gonna, you're poised to say something. Then you, you <laughs> I was gonna say we can end it with a really funny struggle, which is 
my biggest struggle at the moment is trying not to drink a load of wine every night because I need to like mark my evening somehow. Oh, I, don't, I don't struggle <laughs> with that at all. I'm really good at that. I literally just had a case delivered oh, this morning. <laughs> I'm well jealous. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> nice one. Thanks, Megan. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks for listening to this episode of No Cause But The Truth in association with the British Country Music Festival. We would love it if you subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode and extra love if you'd give us a lovely five-star rating. You can even review the podcast and leave a comment with who you'd like to see on. You can find me on social media at Matt Spracklin. See you next time.